all so much for being here with me tonight. I really appreciate it. I will make sure not to. Can you still hear me? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, as I get started on my talk, now if you've been to one of these before, then some of this may be familiar, so hopefully you have your favorite bits. Um, but as I get started telling this story, I'm going to start by hitting the rewind button just a little bit. And as I do, you may go, whoa, 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 wait a second, I think you held your button a little too long. Um, because yes, that is a picture of me when I was in college. Um, and the reason why I'm rewinding all the way back to then is because when I went to college here in Ventura County, I went to California Lutheran University, um, I was learning about three big things that I had no idea were going to come together later in my life to create this adventure of a lifetime. The first of these big things is plate tectonics. Now you know, probably, that the Earth is divided, the surface of the Earth is divided into these plates that slide around, and as a result of these moving, we get things like earthquakes and volcanoes and things like that. What I didn't realize at the time that I was in college is that that was a relatively new idea that had just been accepted by the scientific community just a few decades before I was in college, which is pretty amazing. The second big idea was an idea that had been around for a while, and this is the theory of evolution, and the idea that uh, when Darwin made his famous journey aboard the HMS Beagle, and he observed the different organisms uh, around the world, particularly in this weird place called the Galapagos, um, that it helped to shape some of his thoughts about life on our planet and how it changes over time. And the third big idea I realized at that time was a, a new idea. Um, because this is the discovery of hydrothermal vents. And how I knew that, oh yeah, this is, this is new, this is kind of revolutionary, was because that had happened in 1977, and that was the year that my little brother was born. So I remember going, wow, that's amazing that that just happened so recently. So to rewind again back to this idea of plate tectonics, um, there was this theory of continental drift that had been around since the 30s and uh, hadn't really gained a lot of steam. But back in the 60s, there was starting to be a change in terms of what the scientific community was looking at. And uh, this idea of plate tectonics uh, was coming about. And they were, scientists were starting to realize that these different actions that we were seeing, these volcanic eruptions, these volcanoes, these hot springs, they were connected. But as scientists were trying to come up with the math that helped to prove these big ideas, um, they were finding that something didn't quite match up. And specifically, they were finding that the heat that they were measuring on the Earth's surface wasn't matching up to what the computer models were saying should be there to drive this process because it's the heat that's coming up from the core of the earth that really drives this process. Until uh, a particular scientist from the University of Washington named Clyde Lister said, well, maybe there's these deep sea hot springs and maybe that's where this missing heat is coming up. And so, um, Scientists who were very active at that time started looking around at different places where there was a lot of seafloor spreading, places like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And they identified that there was a very active seafloor spreading zone near the Galapagos Islands. In fact, they uh, realized that that place was spreading about twice as fast as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So they started exploring this place quite a bit. And in fact, in one expedition in the early 70s, did a tow. And uh, it, with the tow, they actually took a vehicle and they towed it down along the seafloor and they had uh, a temperature probe. And they saw a spike in the temperature in this one spot. And they went, huh, that's interesting. And when they went back and looked at the camera and at the photographs that they took during this particular tow, they found that the photographs that correlated with that spike in temperature showed this weird stuff. It was a pile of what looked like clam shells and tennis shoe in a beer can. So they thought, huh, 
That's kind of interesting. Well, it kind of looks like maybe somebody had a clam bake aboard their ship and tossed all the junk overboard. Um, but this is worth checking out. So they named the spot Clam Bake. Scientists have great senses of humor, right? You always find all sorts of jokes in science. And so they decided, let's keep studying this place because we think that this place is going to give us some pretty good answers. That's where this guy comes in. This is Dr. Robert Ballard, and uh, could be the hero of some of you all here. He's most famous for having discovered the Titanic. But let me give you a hint. If you ever happen to meet Dr. Ballard, don't talk to him about the Titanic. He does not want to talk about the Titanic. If you want to be his BFF, talk to him about hyper hyperthermal vents. He'll be so excited. He said that the first week after he found the Titanic, he got 16,000 letters in the mail. And he's like, but I discovered hyperthermal vents, so I didn't get a single damn letter. <laughs> so there's your tip for the night. So um, one thing that's interesting is that uh, if you read Ballard's books, they are fascinating. I don't recommend reading them before going to bed, if you're like me, because you won't be able to sleep. Because uh, your brain just keeps going and going and going and going. But uh, check out his books. He has some very excellent ones. He's a great storyteller. Interesting side fact, he's dyslexic. Which I think is kind of interesting. Um, at any rate. Ballard likes to say that when he was a college student, as an undergrad, he had to give the wrong answers to get A's. Because as he was coming up through school, he was a plate tectonics guy. He thought that this new idea of plate tectonics was the thing, right? But his professors were old school, and they were like, oh, that's wrong. So he had to give the wrong answers to get the A's, to get them the good grades, so that then he could go on to grad school and prove them wrong. <laughs> So this is him climbing into Alvin, and probably also pretty familiar. Anybody get to go see the Titanic exhibit that was over at the CME, the Reagan Library? It's fantastic. You got to see the Alvin sail. You got to see the titanium sphere. Pretty cool. Um, so that's him climbing into Alvin. And a little bit about Alvin is that Alvin is a submersible. So that means that people actually go down in this submersible. Let me paint a picture for you of what that is like. Uh, that titanium sphere, if you didn't get a chance to go see it at the Reagan Library, you look at it and you go, that's it. It's only about six feet around. Bob Ballard was 6'3". So you couldn't even stand up inside of it straight, right, to begin with. Then you put two other people in there with you, and it gets pretty crowded pretty quickly, and all that scientific equipment and everything else. So three people would cram into this tiny little sphere inside this vehicle, and you get lowered down. It's like going down in an elevator, down, 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 down. You look out the portholes, and all you see is blue water, if the lights are on around the vehicle. And it might be an hour and a half, two hours that you spend going down, 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 just seeing blue water. Then you've got to leave that much time for the ascent to come back up. Right? So in a six hour dive or an eight hour dive, you may only get a few hours of bottom time. Really inefficient. And uh, also really dangerous, as you might imagine. I mean, it's, I like to think of these early ocean explorers as being a lot like astronauts. Right? You're going into this incredibly hostile environment that would like nothing more than just to destroy you. Right? So you've got the pressure pressing in on you at all times. And the smallest flaw in your vehicle can just completely destroy you. Um, he has some amazing stories of times when fires broke out in the submersible. Um, or the, it wasn't, the oxygen wasn't flowing. It's really scary, scary stuff. Which is another reason why you probably shouldn't read it before going to bed. Um, but... Um, just fantastic, amazing stuff, but really dangerous and also really inefficient. Now, when you dive near the Galapagos, and when I say dive, in this case, we're talking about people actually diving, but be aware that later on in the talk, if I say dive, and we're talking about ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, um, that no people are going down on those. 
because, you know, it's dangerous, right? Inefficient. Um, but when you dive, you see a lot of this, pillow lava. And they call it pillow lava because as the lava oozes out of the sea floor, it quenches, it cools very quickly and creates these rounded pillow-like structures. Um, it's kind of like a, a toothpaste squeezing out of a tube. It's kind of how it behaves. So that's what you expect to see. Lots and lots of rock, maybe some mud. This is what you see in the deep sea. <laughs> Nothing, right? I mean, it's dark. There's no light down there. Once you get down, you know, past 1,000 meters, 1,000, actually 1,000 feet, um, you don't see anything. There's, there's no light anymore. Um, so keep that in mind, that you're going to a place that's very, very dark. It's very, very cold, usually just above freezing. The temperature is, or I'm sorry, the pressure is tremendous, right? Really hostile environment. So they took Alvin, and they go to this place, it's a very hostile, foreign place, and they expect to see lots of this. Well, they would send down different scientists at different times to go on these different dives. They would all kind of fight. Okay, it's my turn, it's your turn. Um, and this particular guy, a guy by the name of Jack Corliss, even taller than Bob Ballard, by the way, a couple inches taller, poor guy, um, was down there, had the pleasure of piloting the ROV that day, and he calls up to the ship, and his grad student answers, and he says, hey, isn't it supposed to be like a desert down here? And the grad student says, well, yeah. And Jack says, but there's all these animals. And as they're looking out the portholes, they're seeing this tremendous environment. They're seeing these tall columns spewing out what looks like smoke. And they're seeing these huge tube worms waving in the shimmering water. And they're seeing these weird eel-like fish and the things that look like clams and mussels and even pale octopus and things that they don't even know what they are. They named them dandelions. <laughs> you know, these guys were geologists. <laughs> they had no clue what they were seeing. Right? Because, and part of this reason, part of the reason why Jack Corliss was in such consternation is because, remember, looks like this, in the deep sea. And up until this time, scientists, biologists particularly, thought life on our planet can't exist without photosynthesis in some way, right? Whether it's an organism making its own food, or eating an organism that makes its own food, or decomposing an organism that somehow got its energy from the sun, right? So. The fact that this is an environment that looks like this, they're going, how in the heck are, are all these animals surviving way down here in this super harsh environment? Well, they got their first clue when they opened up one of their water samples that they collected. And they all scrambled to open the portholes and run outside to vomit over the side of the ship because they were overwhelmed by the smell of hydrogen sulfide. And that was their first clue, and they went, huh. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, rotten eggs, right? It's the stuff that you smell at a hot spring. And so they started to kick around this idea, wow, could it be that these organisms are somehow eating that hydrogen sulfide? Now this wasn't an entirely new idea. As early as 1870, uh, the idea of chemoautotrophs, that means organisms that can make their own food from chemicals, had been positive. So, they thought, wow, maybe this whole ecosystem is based on chemoautotrophy? It's possible, but it's kind of crazy. But remember, this was all geologists. There's not a biologist aboard the ship. They didn't think they were going to see any living things. So they had no idea what they were seeing, but they knew it was big. So they decided, okay, we just got to collect like crazy. Now, this is 1977. There's no internet. They can't just shoot pictures of this stuff back to the mainland and go, what the heck is this, right? They're working at the speed of film, where they're actually using real film. You guys remember that? 
and uh, developing it, right? And then they could actually look at the photographs, but they're out at the Galapagos. Like, there's, you know, they're cut off. So there's no way for them to figure it out, but they knew they were on to something big. So they just collect and collect and collect, but the problem is, no biologist. Nobody thought to bring formaldehyde to preserve all of the things that they're collecting. So they looked around, and much to their chagrin, they had to sacrifice the store of Russian vodka that they had just picked up in Panama <laughs> to preserve everything that they were collecting down at the hydrothermal vents. Now, what's really cool about this is that this discovery really helped to turn science on its ear. Because like I said, scientists thought that all life on our planet really depended on the sun in some way. And so this entire new ecosystem, relying on something other than photosynthesis, that's revolutionary. That's incredible. And what's even more amazing about that is not only did it make people start thinking about existing life on our planet differently, it made them also start thinking about, well, how did life on our planet start? Maybe it started in a place like that. You know, when the Earth was still being bombarded by ultraviolet radiation, way down deep in the sea might be a pretty good place for life to start. Which then made them start to think, well, if life exists like that on our planet, what does life on other planets look like? It's probably not little green men, right? It could be things like two worms. And in fact, it changed how we started to think about searching for life on other planets. Um, now we have planned missions to places like Io and Europa, some of Jupiter's moons, where we know that, or where we suspect, there's liquid water and volcanic activity. Maybe the conditions are right to find an ecosystem just like this. And I was listening to a podcast, because I have a very long commute to and from work, and they were talking about the Voyager expedition. And I thought, wow, oh, there's something really beautiful in the fact that in 1977, when we discovered hydrothermal vents, and that changed how we thought about life on our planet, that that's the same year that we sent that golden record out on the Voyager expedition with all those sounds of life on our planet out in the universe. Maybe someday I'll, people, somebody, aliens, will find that in here and learn about life on our planet. Um, and I just think that that's kind of Cool little side story. So, as scientists continue to look around at these different seafloor spreading zones and these different places where the plates met up, they found all sorts of these hydrothermal vent communities right there on those plate boundaries. And those uh, different types of hydrothermal vents exist in different flavors, right? So. The, we call them smokers, black smokers, or white smokers, depending on what the color of the stuff shooting out the top is. Uh, and that really is dependent upon the temperature of the water and the chemicals that are in it. So, that's a little bit of background, and now I want to take you to today. This is the EV Nautilus. The EV Nautilus is uh, 211 feet long. She can house 48 people at one time. 17 of those are crew members who help to keep the ship running. And uh, the remainder are people who make up the science team. Um, and that is the scientists, the people who pilot the ROVs or remotely operated vehicles, um, the navigators, uh, the videographers, everybody who basically isn't running the ship. Um, and then science communication fellows, like myself, are all part of that remainder at 31. One thing that's really cool about the EV Nautilus is that she is fitted with a multi-beam sonar system. This is it right here on the hull. And how that's useful is that sonar, um, before the multi-beam sonar, would just take these quick little snapshots. And so then you would have to kind of connect the dots. But with the multi-beam sonar, there's actually this kind of sweeping scan as the ship goes. And what's really cool is that the Nautilus can map like this in super high detail at her top speed of 12 knots. So um, as she crossed the Atlantic, 
um, as she works her way up and down the coast as she went from the Galapagos clear up to Canada. Uh, it, it mapped. Um, and this is an actual map that uh, was created when we were in the Galapagos. This is the seafloor spreading zone that we were exploring. And you can see all of the tiny little ridges and details that exist there. And how that's useful is that it shows us what's there before we go there. So we know what that site is going to look like before we dive on it. Now when we dive, remember, we're not sending people anymore. Super dangerous, super inefficient. So after Dr. Ballard had been spending decades doing this, and you spend so much time in that blue water, and you could die. Right? He realized there's got to be a better way to do this. So as he says, he likes to say that we send the human spirit to the bottom of the ocean rather than actual people. And I think that that's awesome. And how we do that is we send a pair of robots down. So this first one is called Argus, uh, also affectionately called the dope on the rope. Because Argus can't do a whole lot except for get towed behind the ship. And Argus is very heavy. Argus can actually descend to a depth of 6,000 meters. And Argus can be outfitted with a variety of different scientific equipment, depending on what scientists want to study. But the main thing that Argus does is Argus has uh, lights and a camera. So Argus can help to keep an eye on the sky on our other little robot friend, which is Hercules. Now Hercules is more nimble. Hercules is outfitted with a pair of arms that can collect samples, uh, all sorts of cameras, all sorts of lights, uh, and even scientific equipment to collect water samples and sediment samples, and they can strap on extra equipment, and they're always trying new things out. And how it all works is they're actually both tethered to the ship. So from the ship, there's the tether, and then there's Argus first, and Hercules second. The reason why Argus, this big heavy vehicle, is tethered here first is because if you can imagine, as the ship is rocking and rolling on the surface, you don't want your little ROV down there to be getting jerked all over the place by the ship's motion. So Argus is able to absorb that motion from the top, and then therefore that frees up Hercules to go around and be more nimble and collect. Now, as you can imagine though, being tethered, that presents some challenges, right? Because you can put a lot of strain on that cable. It's a very expensive cable, and you also don't want to lose these very, very expensive um, ROVs. Um, so it's really fascinating to watch that very <coughs> delicate dance between the navigator, who works with the bridge, to control the movements of the ship, and the two ROV pilots, who are piloting those two robots in uh, very high stakes, high tension at times. Now what the super cool part about all of this is that as they are exploring, what they are seeing and filming gets sent up through that cable, up to the ship, out via a satellite, out to the University of Rhode Island, where then it's broadcast live. And you, can participate live and watch. So if you go to nautiluslive.org, and uh, during the season, the season will start in June, it looks like about June 6th is when the season's gonna start and run into November. Um, there, when you go to the homepage, um, there is a uh, screen that will show you what's going on. And there's also a box right underneath the screen where you can send in questions. And when um, we're diving, then we have our team who's assembled up on the, one of the top decks of the ship. It's really exciting. There's a couple of basically uh, cargo containers welded together that we have placed all of our very complicated equipment in. And we all sit in this very, very cold, highly air-conditioned space in the dark with all of these monitors and lights and switches and all sorts of stuff going on, and we make magic happen. So 
My position would be right here as the Science Communication Fellow. So when you send in questions, then the Science Communication Fellow, who's on watch, takes those questions and works them into the conversation of everybody here who's working. So we have the video person, the two ROV pilots, the navigator, and then the back row is our science team. So if someone writes in and goes, what the heck was that purple thing you guys just saw? Then it would be my job to then work that into the conversation. Or if somebody wants to know, well, how does the pilot do this? It's my job to work that into the conversation, but also to know the right time to work that into the conversation. Right? So if the ROV pilot's doing some really delicate maneuver, I know that right now is probably not a good time to ask him a really detailed question. Right? And so sometimes you'll hear people kind of nicely tell science communication people, yeah, I'll get back to you in a minute and kind of focus on this. So we have to have that situational awareness and we also have to sometimes act as a human filter with the questions because people love to send in stuff that's a little off color because they want to hear us say it out loud. So we have to like pass that through our human filter and go, yeah, no, I'm not saying that out loud because I get the joke. No, no, not going to be me. And so this was my view looking down uh, that front row on our first dive. I have to say, it was one of the most incredible things in the world because I got to be in the control van with Dr. Ballard his first time going back to those hydrothermal vents since 1977. So he was like a kid in a candy store. And you can see he's hovering. He has a seat in the back row. Like, this is where he's supposed to sit, right? But you can see he's hovering over the shoulders of the ROV pilots, like, oh, go check that out. Oh, go look at that. We're like, Bob, sit down. We're going to be diving for 12 hours. You're good. He's like, I can't. I'm so excited. You know, he burst out in a song, you know. It's just, that man can sing a sea shanty, let me tell you. He's, he's very talented. Um, so the other thing that we do as science communication fellows is we do live interactions with places like museums and schools and aquariums and places like that. So that's me doing a live interaction with my daughter's kindergarten class. And in case you're wondering, at the time, she's older now, in case you're wondering what this thing is, we made little matching puppets. Um, they're called Softopus. We made them out of socks. And so my kids and I would send pictures to each other of what our Softopuses were doing. And, um, and so when we had the interaction with the kindergarten class, we made mine into a puppet. And look, he even has his own little headset. <laughs> and the best thing was, we told the team in Rhode Island we were going to be doing this. So across the bottom, they always put our name. And they put Soctopus across the bottom. <laughs> that was awesome. And, and when he came up, my daughter's class, you could just hear them roar. They were so excited to see it. Um, so that's, that's part of what we do as well as fellows. And then when we come back to our communities, we share our experiences. And uh, it's pretty impressive uh, how many people this program reaches. Um, so back in 2015, I've got to get a new slide here, um, you can see that just through those ship-to-shore interactions, those live interactions, we reached three quarters of a million people. So pretty, pretty fascinating. Uh, I know I had a couple people tell me that they read my articles as well in the Ventura County Star. Um, so I got a chance to uh, do some writing and get that out and share that with the public as well. And of course on our blog, I was with the Girl Scouts at the time, so I posted to the Girl Scouts blog as well. So I was fortunate to go, like I said, in 2015 to the Galapagos and uh, actually got to sail with Dr. Ballard, which was tremendous. And uh, you know how sometimes you meet someone who's an idol and they disappoint you? You go, oh, I shouldn't have met him. Not true with Dr. Ballard. I sailed with the man for three weeks and he never disappointed me a single time. He was just fantastic. Just an amazing human being. And if you ever get a chance, um, he's got some really great TED Talks. And if you get a chance to see him speak live, he is a really great speaker. And uh, I was very pleasantly surprised when we were in the Galapagos that we actually got some shore leave. I thought, oh, I'm going to travel all the way to the Galapagos and I'm never going to get to see tortoises and things like that. Um, and we actually got a fair amount of time, uh, so I was very happy with that. We saw things like, you know, boobies, of course, 
talk about a lot of this. You gotta make booby jokes, right? Um, so blue-footed boobies, red-footed boobies, and I saw uh, birds. We had these frigate birds who um, our poor bosun had to um, hose down the decks every morning because these frigate birds were just fighting over perches. And I don't know if you know about frigate birds, they are really mean. And they fight with each other and the males have these big throat pouches and they extend them to say, this is my spot, mine's bigger than yours, go away, you know, that whole thing. Um, but what's cool about frigate birds, again, about their meanness, is they don't have that oily coating on their feathers that most seabirds have, which would enable them to go and dive for fish. Um, so what they do is they actually harass other birds till they get to the point where they're so upset, they throw up. And then the frigate birds eat the meal that they've just stolen from the other bird. So they're mean and they're gross. I was a middle school science teacher, so I love gross stories because that was what captivated my students, so forgive me. And of course, you know, we got to see tortoises and giant iguanas, and I was really excited to see a Sally Lightfoot crabs because one of my favorite books is Steinbeck's Log from the Sea of Cortez, and he goes on and on at great length about those darn Sally Lightfoots and how fast they were, they could never catch them. And uh, these lava lizards are everywhere. And, you know, these marine iguanas, they're just all over the place. They're all over the sidewalks and the towns, and they're just laying everywhere. And same thing with some of the uh, sea lions, just lying everywhere. At one point, we were walking through a port town, and there was a gazebo with four benches inside, and uh, two women were sitting on two of the benches, talking very quietly, and two sea lions were napping on the other two benches. <laughs> didn't care that the women were there. Um, so, in the Galapagos Rift Zone, we we're about 230 miles northeast of the islands themselves, and all of our dives were within a pretty narrow range, about 2,400 to 2,500 meters deep. And when we started diving, we, as predicted, saw lava. Lots and lots of lava. And it was fresh. Now, for those of you who have a geology background, you're like, what does fresh mean? Right? If you're talking geology, fresh could be like a thousand years, right? Um, well, it was really fresh because the spot that we were diving on, when Bob couldn't sit still, had been explored 10 years previously and had a very active hydrothermal vent system, and it was all pillow lava. So we know that sometime in the past 10 years, up until that point, there had been an eruption that had paved over this thriving vent community. And also, there was a couple other clues. You could see that the rock was a little bit shiny, where the sediment hadn't completely covered it, and there's also these little nodules that eventually break off of pillow lava. And so we knew that it was really fresh within that decade, certainly, and maybe within the last couple of years. And so that first dive, sadly, for all of Bob's excitement, was really disappointing. We expected to find all sorts of great stuff, and we just saw lots and lots of lava. Lots and lots of lava. Um, every once in a while, you'd see something cool, like, what's that purple thing? you know, like a sea cucumber, right? Um, but after a while, you start to kind of appreciate the lava because it does really cool things, like when it flows downhill and creates these weird sheets. Or another cool thing that it did is it can create a lava lake, which is when the lava comes up and it gets cooled off or quenched, and then the lava retreats back down and leaves this dome. And then when the dome collapses, you can kind of see inside. And then sometimes you'd be sailing along and you'd see these weird pillars. And you'd think, oh my god, we found Atlantis. But no, um, it was actually just pillars that kind of once held up the lava dome, that it was a weak spot where cold water had come in and quenched the lava and created this pillar. And then when the dome collapsed, just the pillars were left. So the geology was fascinating. Um, this was one of my favorites. So you know when you pull the plug in the bathtub and the water drains out? Well, that's what happened here with the lava, and it was actually trapped. Those, that kind of draining pattern was actually trapped in the rock as it cooled. I thought that was pretty fascinating. 
This was one of those goosebumps moments for me because as we're sailing along the rift, I realized, wow, we've got the Nazca plate on one side and the Cocos plate on the other. And that was pretty fantastic. I remember Bob just kept saying, we're at the boundary of creation. The boundary of creation. And it was just really cool to think about that. So as you're looking for active hydrothermal events, you kind of know where they've been identified before, and you sail to them, and you start looking for different creatures to tell you you're getting close. So you look for things like um, mussels, you look for things like these spirorbid worms, um, you look for galathaid crabs, which are basically like a lobster with their tail tucked under. Um, if you're lucky, you start to see these two worms, and I really, really wanted to see two worms. That was my, my big thing. And um, these giant clams are amazing because when you crack them open, they have a substance in them that's very similar to hemoglobin, so it looks like blood. Um, so pretty gory when you crack those ones open. And then my favorite animal is the octopus, so of course I was very excited every time we would find an octopus. And then this guy's my favorite. I have to include this because this guy's called a Yeti crab. <laughs> Again, scientists come up with the best names. Um, so as you're sailing along and you're looking for these different creatures, you see all sorts of stuff. And some of it looks pretty normal, right? Like, so you know, okay, that's an anemone. All right, I've seen those before. And then you see something like this. You go, what the heck is that? That's something called black coral. You look at it, you go, but it's white. Well, what you're seeing, the white stuff are the little polyps, the little animals that make it up. And the skeleton itself is black, and that's how it gets its name. And these are those things that those geologists, way back when, called dandelions. They didn't know what the heck they were. It turns out that they're a colonial organism called the siphonophore. Bob actually apologized. He's like, I'm a geologist. I didn't know what it was. We just called it what it looked like. This was a really cool find that we found. This is actually called a flamboyant squidworm. And there is a video on the Nautilus Live website of when they first found it. You can hear the people be like, what? What is that? Is that something eating something? What is that thing? And it turns out that these guys had never been seen in the Galapagos before. And they had only been identified a few years previously in the Philippines. So it was really exciting to get to see them. And they're really cool swimmers. This one we had a lot of fun with. One of the guys called it a headless chicken. <laughs> I don't get it either. Um, but this is actually a sea cucumber. Now normally, proper sea cucumbers, they lay on the floor and they eat their way through the sediments and digest what's digestible and poop out everything that isn't. Well, these guys developed this really cool system where they will actually eat everything that's in an area once they feel like, okay, this area is all depleted, they will poop everything out that they can to make themselves lighter. And then they have this cool hood that then they flap for like a very primitive jet propulsion and they can move to a new location to go feed. So I had a really great time in 2015. And so as you can imagine, once I found out that I could apply to go back in 2016, I jumped on it. And uh, we had the great fortune, I had the great fortune to get assigned to the Southern California borderlands, so right off our own coast. And I got to get on the ship um, down in uh, San Diego and off in San Pedro. And this was the season for 2016. So when I got on in San Diego, we explored all the way down here, almost in the Mexican waters, came up, explored around Catalina, came into Los Angeles for uh, a little bit of a, a personnel change, and then went back out and explored some more. Santa Cruz Basin we explored, and then we went all the way out here to the Patton Escarpment. Very, very cold and very, very deep. But when you look at the bathymetry here off of the coast, you can see it's kind of interesting. Normally, off of the continent, you have a long, flat, broad shelf that stretches out for a very long distance. Um, but here, in California, you see it's different. And I like to say it's like, imagine you tripped over a rug and it's all folded up, right? And so you have this series of these ridges and basins. And in fact, our Channel Islands are the tops of one of those ridges. 
And that was actually caused by tectonic action. Santa Barbara and San Diego actually used to be neighbors way back when. And through tectonic action, it actually rotated and moved. And that created this really tortured kind of bathymetry that we see. So in this particular expedition, we got to dive in a variety of places. So you could see some places were super shallow, and then some places super, super deep. And so what we saw was a lot of mud. Lots and lots and lots of mud. As a matter of fact, one of the watches uh, we refer to as the mud watch because for them, it was just mud all the time. Um, but then you'd be going along and you'd mud, 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 rock, and you'd get really excited because on the rocks, there would be just this huge concentration of life. And if you look really carefully, you could see lots of different species. So you might see like uh, a coral, you might see different types of brittle stars, you might see uh, different types of sponges, you might see an octopus. We saw lots of them. Um, they are really, really good at camouflaging. So very often we would kind of be going right over them and someone would go, octopus! And we would go, aww. <laughs> it was like, oh, we missed it. Can't really turn it around. Um, unless it's like something really fantastic. We just go, oh, I, I missed it. Um, and then, you know, again, we'd find rocks just covered with you know, different types of anemones and different types of sponges. Just absolutely fascinating. I like to call this photograph slow motion stampede because as you can imagine, life in the deep sea, there's not a whole lot to eat there. Um, so uh, in this case, you know, if something comes down from above like a scrap of kelp, all the animals are like, woohoo, we get to eat today. Um, so in this case, you can see all the brittle stars are just moving in to feed on this kelp and this poor shrimp sitting there going, I found it first. And then we saw the same thing again, but this time with sea urchins. And you can see that they all just kind of had that slow motion stampede working their way over the food. One of the exciting things that we found off of Southern California is we found a whale fall. And the reason why that's exciting is because many times when scientists study a whale fall, it's they knew it was there, right? It washed up on the beach, they towed it out, they weighed it down, and they know where it is, and they study it over time because they want to see what the process of decomposition is. It's actually a really important um, ecological habitat in the deep sea. And so we stumbled across this one. We're like, wow, that's amazing. I can't believe we found this whale fall. How cool. And we figured it had been there a while, because you know you see there's no flesh, and there was a couple organisms that were actually starting to colonize the bones. Um, but it hadn't been there too, too long because you can see it's still pretty well articulated and the bones are still in pretty good shape. Um, and then, a few days later, we found another one. And we're just like, what? This is crazy. I can't believe we found another whale fall. And then, we found a third one. Um, so, it just, it was unbelievable um, between my watch, which found two of them, and then the watch right before us found the first one. Um, that we found them all just within a couple of days out there. And you can see the size of this animal, because here's Hercules, and Hercules is about the size of one of those uh, red box like Honda Elements or Scions, right? So it's like a small SUV, a compact SUV. This photograph um, was of these strange clams that we found right off of Catalina. And I will always remember this particular moment because Hercules, as I said, has two arms for collecting specimens. And the one that you can use to collect stuff like this has a crushing force of 6,000 pounds per square inch, right? So you don't want to get on the wrong end of Hercules' hand. And I watched a young lady who was one year out of college, who I had sailed with the year before in Galapagos, who was brand new at that time. Now she was one year out of college, learning how to pilot Hercules for the first time, pick up those clams one at a time and deposit them into a collection basket. And she didn't crush a single one. Now what's amazing about that is that when the people went to take them out of the collection basket, they were fragile enough that people were accidentally shattering them with their hands. So that to me just really shows the power of this program because 
the ship is very much like a teaching hospital in that they take these kids who are in college or right out of college and next thing you know, they're piloting these multi-million dollar machines and doing crazy stuff like that. And so to watch this one particular woman's growth over two years was just absolutely fascinating. And in fact, one of my articles the last time I went out was about that, the whole teaching hospital aspect of it. This thing's called a sea pig. <laughs> Odd, right? Uh, it just kind of eats its way along the sea floor. This is actually a carnivorous tunicate, and a tunicate is an organism that's actually a chordate, um, so that means it's more closely related to us than Mr. Sea Pig, which is an invertebrate. Um, this is a sea cucumber, and these would be his feeding appendages, or its feeding appendages, I should say, um, that when it's feeling relaxed, we'll actually put those up into the water and we'll filter feed with them. And this thing is an acorn worm, and it's got its oral end buried in the sediments, and you can see those sediments passing right through its gut and on its way out. So life in the deep sea is really bizarre, right? I mean, we just we're constantly seeing stuff going, what the heck is that? This fish is called the chimera. It's got characteristics of both bony fish and cartilaginous fish. So it's kind of like a cross between them, so that's where it gets its name, it's a chimera. And lots of fish in the deep sea have this eel-like body structure. Uh, it helps them to move, they don't move very quickly. There's not a whole lot of predation that goes on um, down there. You see a lot of them either have uh, very large eyes to collect whatever light might be down there, including bioluminescence, because some animals will make their own light or some animals have like, no eyes at all, barely. Um, and some of them, they have eyes, but they just don't really even work. Um, one thing that's also kind of cool is, if you notice, this fish has barbels underneath its chin, kind of like a catfish, and they use that to find prey or food down in the sediments. This is a lizard fish, and I loved his little jack-o'-lantern smile that he has. Everybody see the fish in that one? Right. Right. You can just barely see it. We almost missed that angel shark. This was right off the coast of Catalina. And so as you get into shallower water, you start to see more camouflage, right? Because there's actual vision that's going on in these places. Uh, we saw lots of these rays uh, during our expedition in Southern California. Um, this one is a male, because you can see this structure right here that's called claspers and those are the male uh, sex organs to help transfer sperm to the females. Lots of flatfish. Oh, and lots of hagfish. Okay, hagfish are awesome. We saw so many hagfish right here off our coast in Southern California, and of course we just had a blast telling hagfish stories because they're really horrible creatures, um, but really cool. Um, so hagfish don't have a proper vertebral column. They're very flexible. And um, that's helpful to them because they can actually tie their bodies into knots. And you might go, well, why would an animal want to do that? Uh, well, one reason is it makes them really hard to eat, right? So it's a good defense mechanism. But the other is, if you can imagine having this body shape and then trying to eat dead decomposing stuff, on the bottom of the ocean like a whale carcass. How do you get purchase? How do you grab onto this thing? Because it doesn't even really have a jaw. So what they do is they will actually latch on, tie themselves into a knot, and then pull themselves out through the knot. And that is what gives them their purchase to rip that mouthful of dead smelling stuff off of the carcass. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, oh, by the way, um, if you have any eel skin products, like belts or shoes or bags, it's probably hagfish skin. So you probably got a hag bag instead of eel. <laughs> um, and, and I did say I wanted a hag bag really bad for Christmas, because I knew my mom was watching like every day. Sadly, I never got a hag bag for Christmas. Um, so, um, back to the, the really horrible thing about hagfish. Um, so, as if all of that stuff wasn't bad enough, they exude this slime that is just tremendous. And uh, I wish I thought to put a photograph in here, 
but there was actually a, an event that happened maybe in the last year, year and a half, of um, some scientists who were transporting some hagfish in five gallon buckets in their car, and they got into a car accident. And the hagfish can create this slime like instantly. And so if you see the photos of this car, it's just completely slimed on the inside from the hagfish. So look it up, Google it. It's so super cool. Um, so they make this slime. They make this slime, right, to protect themselves if a predator comes after them. But they also use it in this other way. So um, one of the scientists was telling us this hagfish story that as they're, you know, they go and they find a whale. Remember we said food in the deep sea is really hard to find. So they find a whale and they go, yay, I can eat for like two months. This is amazing. This is my dead whale. The rest of you stay away. So what they do is in that slime, there's a toxic substance that makes it so that other creatures can't eat that food. So it was funny, when the scientists told the story, I had this flashback to my Uncle Jeff. And um, my Uncle Jeff, when my cousins were teenagers, had this habit of taking food from the refrigerator and licking it and putting it back in the fridge and telling them, don't eat that, I licked it. And so I thought, wow, the hagfish did the same thing that my Uncle Jeff did. That's so cool. It's a true story. And if anyone knows my Uncle Jeff, don't tell them I told you. So something else we saw, uh, we came to this one field where we had all of these uh, yellow sponges. And we went over one of the sponges and I went, oh, that's weird, there was a hagfish inside of that. And we went, really? And so we all started looking. Every yellow sponge we went over, there was a hagfish inside. We don't know why, just one. Nobody had ever seen it before. So the oceans are so unexplored. I mean, in this kind of detail, we're talking like 5% of the ocean has been explored in this kind of detail. And so you go out with these questions and you come back with 100 more. Of course, I've got to put in some cephalopods because they are my favorite. So we saw lots of different types of octopus. The Dumbo octopus is a big favorite. And they've got these little flaps that make it look like Dumbo. And of course, you guys have probably seen this guy. So we discovered this uh, at about 4 a.m., right, as the uh, 12 to 4 watch was about to wrap up their watch. And they found this thing, and there is video on Nautilus Live, um, that if you go, you can hear them go, oh, what is that, what is that? And one of the, of the people was very firm, no, that's a cuttlefish. That's a cuttlefish. It wasn't a cuttlefish. Uh, it's called a stubby squid. And it's actually kind of amazing that they saw it at all, because normally they could cover themselves in this mucus net and they glue like different sediments to themselves. And so you normally would just go right past it and never see it. So the fact that it was naked is actually really cool. And it's not a dog toy, I swear. Although it looks like you could squeak it, you know, like, like uh, and those googly eyes, that's the real deal. So. Um, this went viral, and it was very cool for me as a fellow to come on to the watch after they had, um, so when I came on for my 8 to 12 watch, um, the person I was relieving said, yeah, yeah, I guess they found something on the last watch, and like everybody's going crazy over it, I don't know what it was, some like purple thing, I don't know. And so I sat down, and of course I'm logging into our social media, and it's awesome to watch it because it went viral. As everyone started talking about it, I could watch the stats as it went viral and people started talking about it and started getting more hits and then all of a sudden we had tons more people watching us. And so I could see this happen live as the world was waking up and starting to tune in. And this thing was so popular, I swear to God, I got back two weeks later, somebody on Etsy was selling socks. <laughs> so that's kind of the beauty of this program is just really connecting with the world and getting to see this kind of stuff in real time. So before I wrap this up, there's one last thing that I want to share with you guys. Remember I talked about the fact that it's very inhospitable in the ocean, right? It's really, really dark, it's really, really cold, and there's a ton of pressure. Well, for every 33 feet or 10 meters you descend, the pressure increases by about 14 and a half pounds per square inch, right? That's why when you dive in the swimming pool, your ears hurt, right? Um, so there's this thing that scientists love to do. We love to take these little um, coffee cups and decorate them and send them down with the ROV 
and the ocean pressure crushes them. And that's cool. Like, you go, oh, I had a coffee cup, now I have a shot glass. Awesome. <laughs> right? Um, and so that's awesome. But, you know, I'm kind of an overachiever. And so I said, well, if we can crush a styrofoam coffee cup, what could we do to one of those styrofoam heads? And then I thought, well, but one head, you know, you go, oh, I, it was big, and now it's small. Look, I've got to have a pair of heads, right? So that I have the before and the after view, right? So I took a pair of heads, and we decorated them with Sharpies, and I had um, friends and family and coworkers and Girl Scouts and everybody decorate these styrofoam heads. And then I got to the ship, and one of the uh, ROV pilots said, well, you got to put mohawks on them. <laughs> and so he taught me how to do it with this little tiny screwdriver, and you, you know, undo a rope, and you put it in strand by strand. I felt like I was putting in hair plugs, like one strand at a time. I apologized every time. Um, and so then, of course, we um, decided, well, we've got to send them down on the deepest dive. Well, but who gets to go? is the question. So I named them Pedro and Diego, because I got on in San, uh, San Diego and got off in San Pedro. And we had a contest. We did a social media contest to decide who was going to win or lose, depending on how you look at it. And uh, Pedro won. Uh, it might have had something to do with a little movie called Napoleon Dynamite that came out a number of years ago, Vote for Pedro. Um, so anyway, Pedro won. And we knew that when we sent them down to about 11,000 feet, that he would be exposed to about 4,700 pounds of pressure per square inch. So I want to show you my friends. So this is Diego. You can see, normal, head size, nice mohawk. And I would like to show you Pedro. <laughs> So that is our friend Pedro. And what's really cool is you can still read everybody's signatures. You can still see everything very clearly that was drawn on him. Notice the mohawk is still the same size, right? So it obviously couldn't be compressed very much. But I just, I love the side by side. <laughs> So, looking at that, I think that you can probably agree that sending the human spirit to the bottom of the ocean in ROVs is probably a lot better and safer when we do it with telepresence. So, I love doing these talks. Thank you so much for having me here. I'd love to answer questions that you may have. Um, keep in mind, nautiluslive.org is the website to check out. And I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Just following up on Pedro and Diego, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what these creatures that live at that depth are like. What? How are they prepared to withstand that kind of pressure? Is their flesh soft? Is it hard? Is it Excellent question. So she, she wanted us to know um, how do the creatures down in the deep sea deal with that same pressure? Well, that's the beauty of adaptation, right? So those organisms way down deep like that, they're adapted to deal with those pressures. And as you bring them up to the surface, right? Exactly. So she went, right? Because then you've got more pressure on the inside than you do on the outside. So if you've ever been deep sea fishing and you pull up a fish and they've got like their swim bladder coming out of their mouth, right? That's that result of that change of pressure. Um, so they're adapted to be down there. That's, that's, their, that's their jam, right? And that's what they're used to. But yeah, pretty fascinating stuff. And I had another one? Ah, excellent question. He wants to know who funds these expeditions. So Throughout his whole career, um, Dr. Ballard has been hustling money to try and, and fund his various um, expeditions. Part of that, uh, in the early part of his career, he had dreams of, of the Navy basically helping to provide for a wet NASA, right? Because um, the government was really heavily funding a lot of exploration at that point. We were very heavy in the Cold War, right? So uh, the Navy was very interested in knowing what the bottom of the ocean looked like so they knew where to hide the subs or where subs might be hiding, right? Um, but um, funding dwindled 
And so he went out and started hustling up money from other places. And so after, you know, 30 years of doing this, he founded his own nonprofit because he was already doing that anyway. And so for the OET, he has a variety of funders. So the Navy does still fund yes. and make sure you pressure your legislators to continue to fund programs like that. Um, but then he also has to go out and get corporate funding as well. So as you can imagine, uh, a lot of oil and gas companies are very interested in the deep sea. So uh, Citgo has been another major funder of theirs. Um, they've also partnered with organizations like uh, Ocean Networks Canada, um, which basically uh, they have a series of deep sea sensors that are wired, hardwired to the land, where they have continuous monitoring of different conditions in the deep sea. And so they'll make part of their expedition season um, you know, going and doing maintenance on these types of installations. And so then Deep Sea, or uh, Ocean Network Canada then pays them for that as well. So, you know, again, lots of different funders. Um, there are some big major donors. So um, uh, the ship, there's an amazing story about how the ship itself was donated actually by Vinnie Viola, who uh, is a, was a hedge fund manager and is the owner of the Florida Panthers. And uh, Bob actually, through his relentless charm and persistence, um, talked Vinny into donating the ship after Vinny had purchased it for himself to make a yacht out of it. So uh, really, really fascinating. I think uh, Vinny just said, you've got a better use for it than I do. Um, so yeah, he's got a number of different um, sponsors and donors that help to support it. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, when you do all the mapping, uh, how does that, does that eventually go to some central knowledge where, you know, the world is, has access to that? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, so the question was for all of the mapping, does that go to a centralized place where everyone has access? Yes, and as a matter of fact, all of the science that's done on the Nautilus is all open source and open access for the scientific community. So all of the mapping, all of the specimens actually go to Harvard, where they're kept in their um, comparative zoology museum. Um, and then all the geological specimens go to the University of Rhode Island. And so any scientist who's interested in studying any, any of them can put in a request and can study the specimens, because they want to share everything. Yes. Do they have more concentration of minerals falling out of it, and that would be beneficial for the sea life? Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was, the vents, do they have concentrations of minerals flowing out of them, and are they beneficial for the sea life? So the organisms that are there are adapted to those conditions, and yes, some of those minerals and things that are coming out, like particularly the hydrogen sulfide, um, are some of those chemicals that the chemoautotrophs are actually breaking the bonds in those chemicals and using that energy then to create their own food. Um, now one thing that's really interesting is that some of those creatures, like those big long tube worms, um, they don't have a gut. They actually, their insides are actually packed with these bacteria that do that you know, chemosynthesis um, and then they share their food that they've made with their hosts. Um, so really fascinating and interesting uh, complex ecosystem that's going on down there. Yes, in the back. Yes, good question. So is there information about the relationship between the different species of the different vents? Yes, in fact, uh, not only are they looking at, well, how are these different organisms at these different vents related? And they will do you know, genetic studies and they'll look at the physiology of the animals. Um, but they also think that whale falls may act as stepping stones in the deep ocean for these hydrothermal vent communities. Because you would wonder, well, if a vent pops up, how do the creatures get there, right? If it's a brand new vent and it's popping up somewhere, where do the creatures come from? Because it's such a specialized community. And so that's one of the studies, that's part of the reason why we were so excited to find whale falls, um, was because we want to study those and see if, in fact, they do act as stepping stones between these different environments. Yes. Yeah. 
Good question. Um, so yeah, so it is. It's naturally very, very dark. And the um, question was, how does the submersible get that energy to actually you know, have those super, super bright lights? All of that electricity gets fed down through that cable. So that cable, part of the reason why it's so expensive is not only does it have you know, super high tensile cable so we don't snap it, but it's also got the, um, the electric uh, cable coming down and then it's also got the cable going back up to the ship to carry the feed from the cameras. Any other questions? Oh, one more in the back. Oh, two more. Yes. When you talk about that feed going down, is it possible now with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to avoid the cumbersomeness of having cable TV, so to speak? Mm, good question. Um, it's not at this point because uh, you know the water is so dense. You know, it would be very difficult to transmit that kind of a signal through there. Um, plus, I would suspect that uh, because you do have you know kind of a hard wire, it's a lot faster to actually transmit that information that way, more reliable. Good question. And I saw one more hand. Yes. This uh, kind of well, not sea uh, life related, but have you found any really unusual uh, man-made objects? Kind of ah, thing? good because question. It's been busy. Yes. Uh, so he asked if we found any unusual man-made objects. Um, you know, the one thing that Bob says is he always says, you know, when we find the UFO, <laughs> he said, I don't care if I'm sleeping, you can get me. Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, in the Galapagos, we saw, actually saw very little trash, um, but off of the coast of Southern California, especially off of the coast of Catalina, uh, found lots of trash. We found lots of unexploded ordnance, right, because of the, the testing and the, you know, military action that goes on out there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, lots and lots of trash. At one point we found what was really interesting looked like a bunch of soda cans that had been tossed overboard in a, you know, a bag like back in the 70s because they were all still in perfect shape. I mean, I can picture it was a Hawaiian punch can and 7-Up and like maybe RC Cola. And, and it was definitely like the 70s version of these cans and, you know, the, the old top, like the, not the modern day pop top. Um, so we did find quite a lot of trash here off of Southern California. Mm, good question. So how do they do the buoyancy control on Hercules? Um, so that yellow stuff at the top of Hercules that you saw um, is actually a foam that is uh, not very compressible. And so, of course, you know, if that cable, worst case scenario, were to snap, you don't want to be leaving that guy on the bottom of the sea, right? So that, that synthetic foam, I think I may have said that incorrectly, um, actually helps it to then shoot back up to the surface. Um, slightly, slightly, barely, but yes. Any other?